Hey everybody, Dr. Dan here. This is week 12 for History 1070, and this week we're studying chapter 11, which is a, it's a pretty good chapter. It's got everything I like. Um, it, it brings me up to modern times so I can relate to some of the stuff I read in the news, and also it's relatively short, so that's cool. And the title of the chapter is Towards the Pacific Century, and so it's, it's really talking about this time period uh, following World War II. I know, you know, last week we talked about the USSR and, and um, the idea of communism and the influence it had, and uh, this week we're, we're moving out to the Pacific farther, and we're going to talk about Japan and Taiwan and, and Korea. So, uh, pretty cool. So, the Japan part is, is a great thing to read because uh, there's a couple of aspects to it. So, one of them is, you know, here's a country that the U.S. nuked in the you know 40s to end World War II, and with all of that devastation, um, the U.S. and Japanese relationship heals really quickly after the war, and 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 there's a number of reasons for that, uh, but but uh, MacArthur, who was head of the Pacific Forces, is is put in as sort of the you know occupying president of Japan, if you will, after World War II, and the U.S. moves in and with the help of you know what's left of the Japanese government reforms this new Japanese government based on a constitutional model and based on some western standards uh western style education western style laws and court system that sort of thing and it's it's a very successful relationship and and you know there were people in the US who thought Japan should be punished for all of the atrocities during World War II and all the damage that they caused to the U.S. during World War II. But, but really what was going on in our government and the U.S. government at the time was that there was this big fear that Japan would come under the influence of Russia, of the USSR, and because there was already fears of China and communism under Mao Zedong, the last thing the U.S. wanted was um, any communist influence, any more communist communist influence in the Pacific than there already was. So that's one of the reasons that um, um, you know the U.S. Um, was was really behind staying unified with Japan and helping them build their country into a country that was an ally with a strong economy and also a place where we could keep our troops. So that was the other part of it. But but so understand that that the that the U.S. really helped Japan um, after right after the war and 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 because of that. Um, Japan demilitarized, which we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but the other thing is their industrial sector grew like crazy. And um, for a number of reasons, Japan has always been a very well-educated, disciplined country and with a highly skilled labor force. So they also had the advantage of all of their old industry was destroyed during the bombings in World War II. So they could start all over again with all new stuff. They got financial assistance from the U.S., and um, uh, the the economy, the Japanese economy, just took off. And I remember, boy, I remember in the '60s, like the first time someone I, I grew up way out in the country, but the first time I ever saw a Honda, you know, and a lot different than they are now, but a Honda car, you know, back in the '60s, the, the, the small Japanese car was a brand new thing, and it was it was weird and sort of a novelty. Well, you know, from transistor radios to Japanese cars, the uh, Japanese industrial and consumer base exploded, uh, you know, making great products, getting very strong uh, from an economic standpoint, and, and very much stabilizing. So that's what the chapter tells you about Japan, and it, it, takes, you, um, it takes you all the way to the current times which is interesting, and and the one thing to think about, and I almost read, uh, almost wrote an essay question on this, but I didn't. The one thing to think about is that um, when Japan's new constitution was written with the help of the Americans, um, part of the constitution was this notion of demilitarizing, and uh, you know makes sense. I mean, the same thing happened in Germany after World War II. You know, you don't want these countries that uh, maybe you saw as aggressors to remilitarize and start trouble all over again. So uh, uh, um, one part of Japan's constitution was this idea of demilitarization. And as you read through this short section of the book, really, um, at the end of it, it talks about the current prime minister, Abe, and how he's a proponent of rebuilding the military. Um, and, and again, I think that you know every country can do what they want to do. 
and that's fine, but it's something to think about and, and maybe a critical thinking issue for you. It's like, hey, should Japan do this or not? And and if not, do we have any right to say anything about it in the first place? So, so read about that. Japan's interesting. And then the essay um, exercise, which is, I call it a mini essay because it's like two sentences, uh, has to do with Japan too. And I'll cover that when I get done with the lecture, which is going to be a short one. So um, after you read about Japan, you're going to read about Taiwan. Um, Taiwan, Singapore, and Hong Kong, uh, well, Taiwan and Hong Kong are, are kind of weird in, in the sense that um, they kind of belong to China, but they really don't. They're fairly autonomous, and I'll try to explain that as I go through it. But after the, um, the section on Japan in the book, the, the book talks about Taiwan. So, you know, when I was growing up reading history, you know, back in the day, back in the ancient times, uh, you know, we always called Taiwan the Republic of China. And, and because that's how they identified, as opposed to big China, main China, which is the People's Republic of China. And the reason there's this difference is, if you remember from um, our last reading about Japan, and, or uh, about, I'm sorry, about China, and about Mao Zedong and Chiang Kai-shek, and uh, the revolution, you know, the communist revolution, you know, what happens is that, that after the communists take over China back in the 40s, um, um, Chiang Kai-shek, who is the nationalist leader, um, he and his nationalist Chinese forces get driven off of mainland China onto Taiwan. And Taiwan is about 90 or 100 miles off the coast of China. And it's not a very big place. I think I think it's about 90 or 100 miles wide. It's an island, 90 or 100 miles wide and maybe like 200 miles long. So Taiwan isn't huge, but it's incredibly densely popul populated. Um, and, and so Taiwan is where Chiang Kai-shek ended up as the, the nationalist Chinese. And, and Chiang Kai-shek still thought that he represented the real China. And he died like uh, not in the 70s, I think. Uh, but the whole time, you know, he thought that um, nationalist China, Taiwan, um, the Republic of China, was the real China, and that one day that the nationalists would take over from the communists and get back, you know, the big, the main continent, the main part of China, um, which which didn't happen. But what did happen was Taiwan remained um, an independent. They're an independent, autonomous country, but. Um, um, Beijing claims that they are part of China, but they haven't really done anything about it yet. And Taiwan has been taking buying arms from the U.S., which doesn't s s sit well with Beijing at all. So Taiwan is a very contested place, um, and it's very controversial to this day. And you know, the Chinese say, "Hey, this is ours. It belongs in our sphere of influence." And the Taiwanese don't. You know, they're a capitalist, highly advanced. Society and they they really don't want anything to do with the communist out of Beijing. So so that's an ongoing controversy. And I think, you know, if you read the news at all, I'm sure you've heard, or especially over the past year, you know how controversial it is because the U.S. wants to sell uh, strategic weapons to Taiwan or fighters or something like that. And of course, it it makes China angry. So that's why Taiwan is the way it is. It's sort of independent. Uh, it's such a hot potato that no one really wants to deal with it right now. And, uh, but the point is that it's a highly advanced society, um, highly productive, highly industrialized, again, very advanced societies. Um, you know, Japan, Taiwan, uh, Singapore, and South Korea to a large extent are, are a lot different than U.S. society. And I would say they're, they're much, more, much more advanced in their education, their social programs, and a lot of their technologies. So uh, Taiwan's one of them. And then it talks about Korea. I think most of you know the story with Korea, but again, and, and I, we covered it in subsequent chapters, but again, it comes down to this uh, communist influence. So, you know, the Korean War, again, was a war of, you know, communist versus nationalist, if you will, and you know how it ended up. So today we have North Korea, and uh, North Korea is communist and, and really um, a police state, really sort of a back, you know, a lockdown uh, police state under Kim Jong-un. And uh, but South Korea has has rock and rolled now um, after the at, at the end of the uh, Korean War or the Korean conflict, um, South Korea went through some changes. So when you go through the reading, you'll read about 
um, some little mini, mini revolutions in their government, um, some authoritarianism, but um, South Korea has evolved into a pretty stable democracy. And as far as an industrial powerhouse goes, I mean, come on, you know, all of the, you know, Samsung and Hyundai and, and all of those car companies have just been so successful. And uh, it's a very stable, South Korea is a very stable country. And uh, again, it fits in with this, you know, the little tigers is the metaphor that the author uses, but one of these, these uh, really powerful Asian countries. And all of these countries have boomed um, since World War II, since the end of World War II. So, you know, that was, you know, the mid-1940s and it's 2020 today. So really, it's only been 70, 80 years. And the, these countries have turned, especially South Korea, into a place that was uh, extremely rural into a major global industrial powerhouse. So it's pretty fascinating how that's worked. And and a lot of it's due to education throughout Asia and how skilled the, all the workers are and and how uh, dedicated they are to the, to their jobs and uh, personal discipline. So it has a lot to do with it, just a big cultural difference. So that's Korea. And then um, the, uh, the book talks about Singapore and Hong Kong. I've never been uh, to either, but would love to go. And uh, Singapore is probably, of all the countries uh, in the world, is probably one of the most prosperous and uh, best educated and cleanest place. Uh, places there are. So the book talks a little bit about Singapore. And again, uh, culturally, just, uh, you know, 360 degrees different than the U.S. They're um, really into personal discipline, education, uh, extreme cleanliness uh, everywhere. And uh, it, it makes a difference. And, and there's um, the, the standard of living in Singapore is is really high. There's a lot of social programs. Everything's taken care of for citizens. Um, and it seems I'd love to go there someday, so maybe we can go. Um, and then Hong Kong is another one that's tough to understand because, you know, it's part of mainland China, but it was uh, taken over by the British back in the old colonial days, and the British held possession of it until 1997, so not that long ago. Uh, there was It was a 99-year lease deal, I think, in 1898. But anyway, um, yeah, the British held Hong Kong for all those years, all the way up to 1997. And in the process, Hong Kong was totally separate than China. So Hong Kong wasn't communist. It was this, you know, highly uh, developed, highly industrialized, uh, highly service-oriented, booming, booming place. It's like one big dense city. And, um, and, and, and China was hands off because the Brits had it. But when the Brits um, uh, gave them their independence in 1997, um, you know, China came in and said, well, this is part of mainland China, but China made the promise that um, it wouldn't change anything in Hong Kong for a period of 50 years. So, you know, Hong Kong could remain capitalist, uh, democratic, um, that sort of thing, although recently China has imposed, actually China hasn't imposed anything. The, the new leader of Hong Kong has done some outreach to China to try to normalize some things, and it has not gone over well with the Hong, the citizens in Hong Kong or the university students in Hong Kong. And if you've watched any TV in the past eh, four months, uh, five months, you've seen, you've seen a lot of protests in Hong Kong, which have since died down. But, but one of the reasons is, is that, you know, Hong Kong is, again, like Taiwan, it's, it's kind of part of China, uh, but it's so different in that uh, it's, you know, capitalist democracies and, and very successful you know, economically hugely successful. So um, kind of kind of hard to understand how these things work, but, but it's certainly a hotbed in the uh, Pacific. And I think neither China or the U.S. wants to pursue any of this because we have such a um, massive amount of trade between China and the U.S. and our economies count on each other. And I don't think either country wants to go to war with the other one because it would totally ruin the economies of both countries, let alone, you know, all the destruction from the military. So anyway, there's that. And then finally, the chapter finishes with um, Australia and New Zealand, which, you know, this is world history, but we never really talk about them. Uh, again, two places I haven't been and would love to go. But, you know, the book makes the point that New Zealand and Australia, even though they're on that side of the world in the South Pacific, uh, really aren't you know, don't relate to Asia other than they have incredible trade relationships with Asia. And, and Australia has a lot of immigrants 
uh, from Asian countries as well. So there's a there's a relationship there, uh, but but New Zealand and Australia are are you know British colonies and and still uh, are still closely affiliated with Britain and uh, have have had opportunities to vote for total independence from Britain and have chosen not to. So um, New England and Australia are still uh, very Western, very British. And from everything I've seen, like especially Australia, you know, very Americanized in places as far as like the houses and the neighborhoods and what all that looks like. It looks like a suburb around here. So um, there's that. And I think that's about it for this chapter. So let me get into the um, little essay. And it's a mini essay because it really can be done with two sentences. And I'm just looking at it on my notes. So um, what you're supposed to do is identify one significant difference between Japan's culture and U.S. culture, and that can be related to gender, education, religion, personal ethics, economics, behavioral norms, entitlement programs, um, and discuss how this difference has affected Japanese society or policies. So um, I provide an example for you, which is going to ruin it for you now because you guys can't use this example, but my example is uh, that education is highly valued in Japanese culture and getting admitted into a Japanese university is very competitive because of the value put on education the Japanese labor force is highly skilled so there I'm telling you about um, a cultural thing the value of education in my first sentence and in my second sentence I'm telling you the the consequence or how it's affected Japanese society it's affected Japanese society by uh, providing a highly skilled labor force so that's the assignment. It, it's like a two-sentence deal. So find something you notice in the book. Could be related to gender. Uh, there's some stuff in there about entitlement programs and how, um, how that's affected Japanese society or Japanese law. So um, some of you are going to overthink this. Don't overthink it. Just find something that they do that's different and, and why, you know, how does it manifest itself in society? What difference does it make? So maybe you'd, you'd read something about, you know, the government believes in this, and because of that, they do this. Or um, just, just do some creative thinking and figure it out on your own. Um, that's it for this week. If you have any questions, let me know. Get into this chapter because it's really short, and I think um, it, it, it helps all of us sort of understand our world a little bit better. Uh, we don't have to put that much work into it, but I think it's important. So um, enjoy, and if you have any questions, let me know. Take care now. Bye-bye.